If you have your Bibles with you, look at Matthew chapter 1 and uh, also place a marker in Luke chapter 2. We're going to be doing a very traditional uh, overview of the Christmas story today. And we think, well, all of us know the Christmas story, and we do. I expect that most of us understand the general uh, parts of it. Uh, and that could be said about every Christian doctrine, every verse of the Bible, couldn't it? And so we are called as uh, believers to rehearse and be refreshed. And what could be more important than the holy night when the time was perfect and the Lord Jesus came into the world to forgive us of our sins? What could be more important than that? I think a, a terrific and worthy thing to do to spend our time for a bit this morning to think about the coming of the Lord Jesus, the narrative, the parts, the pieces, the participants, the characters, and then, of course, obviously, the effect. Uh, o Holy Night. And I'll begin reading in Matthew 1, 21 through 23. And the Bible says that she, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, and all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. J.I. Packer, the theologian that uh, I quote sometimes, he said this about the, 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 the impact of, the, the, of this one night, this coming of the Savior. Listen to what Packer said. The Christmas message is that there is hope for a ruined humanity. Hope of pardon, hope of peace with God, hope of glory, because at the Father's will, Jesus became poor and was born in a stable so that 30 years later, he might hang upon a cross. The Bible teaches that this Jesus who came as a baby, uh, he was one who came and was born to die, to die for our sins. And this is the centrality of the gospel that Jesus did come, taking on humanity like ours, and yet being divine so that he may forgive us of our sins. As we think about the main passages in Luke, chapter 2, and Matthew chapter 1, uh, we're going to divide this narrative, this nativity, this concept or the story of uh, the holy night and the coming of the Savior with three main points or three main considerations. I'll draw to your attention a holy timeline, uh, and then we'll look at the entourage of supporting characters in the stories, and then we'll look at the event that actually did change everything. First then, a holy timeline. At God's discretion and God's will, according to his plan, on a certain, at a certain moment in time, God began to act on the earth to carry out what he had planned in his mind before the foundation of the world. At a moment in time, on a day, Jesus came into the world through the Virgin Mary's womb. Natural birth, a holy timeline, and this holy timeline begins, I'll call your attention to, an ordained plan of God. This was uh, God's plan that at a certain day and time, when everything was perfect, Jesus would come into the world. And this is found in Galatians chapter 4, and I'll begin reading in verse 4. Galatians 4, begin in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that they may receive adoption as sons. Uh, let's unpack that for a second. Born of a woman, he was a real man. And this was the son of God. He was truly God. Truly God and truly man. At a moment in time, the union of divinity and humanity came in the form of a human being. And it didn't just come with the, with, the, with the birth narrative. It began 
at conception, in the womb of Mary, was the fullness of God and the fullness of man. How a miracle, a most amazing miracle, that the baby embryo, the, the, the tiniest human thing, the zygote in the womb of Mary, could be fully God. And the only way this could be is if God would humble himself to, to, to downgrade himself to be humbled to the limitations of infancy. And not just the limitations of a baby who can coo and play and crawl, but the limitations of having no intellectual concept. Every limitation of the smallest of uh, babies in the womb. That was the degree of humility that Jesus took upon himself. You say, how is it possible that God could not be practicing the fullness of his godness? Humility beyond our concept that Jesus would become a man. Fully God and fully man in the womb of Mary and nine months unaware of the events outside the womb, his watery place of preparation. No awareness Jesus was truly humbled to the degree that he took not the privilege of his divinity, but he set the aside in order to fully grasp what it's like to be you. And I think much of our faith faltering is because we think our God is too far away. How closer could our God be than in the womb of a woman? Bringing him here like our mothers brought us here. How much closer to our humanity could a man be than to be a man? And that encapsulated in the womb of his own mother. An ordained plan, it says then in the scripture, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. What law were we learning about in Romans? The law of sin and death. The soul that sins shall surely die. But then we have the law of grace, and that is that by sacrifice, by atonement, by grace, we can have life. So that the law of sin and death that necessarily brings judgment is set aside because Jesus received the judgment for us. The reception of Jesus' work, uh, the, the, the wholeness of Jesus' work, let me say, began in the womb. In fact, it began in eternity past. It began, the, the timeline, the plan began to have its effect on the earth that moment of concept when the Holy Spirit hovered over Mary, as the scripture said would happen. And Jesus was made a baby in the womb. Verse 6, And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of the Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. What is Christmas? It is this message that we are adopted into the family of God and our sins are forgiven. And Jesus went to the extraordinary length of the humility of being a zygote in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And this for our benefit. So that why? So that we may be redeemed and that we may receive the adoption as sons. A holy timeline. When the time was perfect, and notice it's very important, the fullness of time, the perfect time that's when Jesus came. Why do we stop and pause to remember Christmas? We don't think that Jesus was actually born on this particular day, the 25th of December, on our current calendar. No reason to think that's the case. We don't have evidence of what the particular day was, for sure. But we pause and have historically paused to remember this tremendous miracle that when the time was perfect, God sent Jesus into the world not as a full-grown warrior champion, not as a governing ruler, but as the tiniest form of human life. And then for nine months to not know a single thing outside the womb of his mother. This was our Jesus. And this was what happened when the time was right. Oh, holy night. No wonder we say, oh, holy night. You know the word holy, what it means? Separated for God's purpose. 
separated for God's purpose. Oh, this night separated for God's purpose. That deity and humanity could dwell together. And that for what purpose? That we could have our sins forgiven and that we could be adopted as sons. It's a time. There's a time that God is doing this. This is why we pause and celebrate. Not only an ordained plan, a timely decree. Notice this. Now we're, we're going to start looking at all these passages. And some of them are going to be on the screen. Some of them you'll have to use your Bible or your phone. A timely decree. Luke 2, 1 and 2. Luke 2, 1 and 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed. All the world should be registered. This was the first registration when uh, Curinus was uh, governor of Syria. So the time was perfect according to what God said he's going to do. And then further, during that period of time, Caesar Augustus called for everyone to come and be registered for the taxation. Perfect time. God planned it. God is acting on his plan. I think what I want you to see, not only just the Christmas narrative and what actually happened, but I want you to see the sovereign handiwork of God in bringing about his purposes in our lives and in the world. It was so perfect, this timing, that a decree came out from Caesar in his mind, he was making a decree to gain the taxation that he, he sought for, for Rome. But in the plan of God, it was a perfect decree to bring about Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. And that was a very important and necessary thing. We have a timely decree, a prophesied location, Luke 2, 3 through 5, is uh, repeating this promise that the, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. And that was prophesied in uh, Micah 5 and 2, a prophesied location. <clears throat> Luke 2, verse 3. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. <clears throat> because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, his fiance, who was with child. So notice the perfection of all of these things coming together on God's timeline. He had planned from before the world began to save us of our sins through the giving of his own son. The own son that he would give would be fully God and fully man. And then perfectly at time, he brings Jesus into the world in the womb of Mary. He decrees through Caesar Augustus that everyone must come to their hometown so that they can be registered for the taxation. And why is it so imperative that Jesus get to Bethlehem for his birth? Because of Micah 5, 2. The prophecy requiring that this baby would be born in Bethlehem. And so Caesar didn't know he was playing into the handiwork of God, the, the, the foreknowledge, the plan of God. Caesar didn't know. And isn't that just like most of the world around us? They don't know that God is doing things to carry out His plan in mysterious ways, His wonders to perform. And we stand back and say, what is this? What is this sickness? What is this financial delay? What is this job situation? What is this relationship problem? What is this I'm going through? It's the same God who works His timeline for His own glory and for our benefit. And look at the little baby, Jesus he came perfectly on time. And he was positioned to be born in the perfect, required, prophesied place, Bethlehem. This prophesied location. Listen, Luke 2, 3, and 5. And they would all be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went to Galilee from town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. All right, now there's Bethlehem. We've got to have Bethlehem because this is where the Messiah must be from. He was of the house and lineage of David. All of this is part of the regulations of being taxed. Do you see how all of this is coming together? And from the natural human perspective, 
we would say, look at this. Isn't this a coincidence? My goodness, please, as fast as you can, stop thinking about coincidences in a world under the auspice of a sovereign God. Please, stop thinking of coincidences. When our God is in control of all things, big and small, And so they came to be registered. A holy timeline is unfolding so that Jesus could be brought into the world at the perfect time. And then a Savior is born. Luke 2, 6, and 7. This timeline culminates with the birth of Jesus. Luke 2, 6. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. While they were where? In Bethlehem. And we also know that they had gone looking for a place to stay, an inn, a hostel, a hotel, nothing available. No room for Jesus in the inn. And so they're in the farming shed, probably an awning or some type of maybe a cave where the cattle would be, would be, would be kept. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothing. Notice the word firstborn here. I think it's, uh, it is a crucial and, and very incorrect doctrine to think of the perpetual virginity of Mary. It is an incorrect doctrine. Uh, we must, as believers of the Bible, not trying to be offensive, but stating simply and clearly the Bible doesn't teach the perpetual virginity of Mary. And it doesn't teach that Jesus was her only son. And this, her firstborn, was Jesus. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothing and laid him in a manger, a trough, because there was no place for them in the inn. Jesus came into this world, very humble beginnings. How many of you could stand back and say to yourself, you know, I've got some strikes against me, economic challenges, I've got strikes against me with my health, or I've got, I've got strikes against me because I have trouble with, with my parents or my spouse or my kids or my neighbor. I've got these strikes against me. I'm going to tell you this, poor Jesus starting in the lowest place. And this was God. If God would take his own son, fully God and fully man, and put him in a feed trough, why, would we, why should we be surprised that we have difficulties in this fallen world? Who are we to raise our fists in anger and rebellion against God who, who leads and guides and directs our lives? We have no right if God would put his own son in a feed trough, we need have no place to say, you have no right, oh God, to do this to me. We should say and say, I know you love and you have a purpose. You're working out your timeline to produce your glory and my benefit. This is the only lifestyle that I know that actually works. Because if you set out to live your life thinking, oh, I don't deserve to ever have a, I don't deserve that. The words justice and deserving, let's think about those words. Oh, I don't deserve to be sick. Uh, the child says, I don't deserve to have childhood arthritis. I don't deserve to have diabetes. I don't deserve to have this problem or that problem. I don't deserve to be laid off. I don't deserve for my spouse to leave me. I don't deserve for my kids to be difficult. I don't deserve this. Stop with the deserve language. In, instead, replace your deserving language with humble language like this. God, every good and perfect gift comes from you. And because of your covenant of love through Jesus for me, all things work together for my good, even when I cannot see it yet. I sometimes say that to myself. All things are going to work together for my good because I'm called according to your purpose. Even though I cannot see it yet. Now, that's my addition to the Bible. You shouldn't add words to the Bible, but if I'm speaking and trying to encourage my own heart, and I say this, if, I, if I'm trying to encourage my own heart, and I say, I know all things work together for good, even though I don't see it yet. 
I think that's an okay addition, as long as you don't say it's scripture. Let's talk for a few minutes some more about this, this birth story, an entourage of supporting characters. So call out to me some of the characters that you think of um, that were part of the narrative. How about the shepherds? Yes? Angels. Wise men. Herod. Mary. Joseph. Elizabeth. John the Baptist. Come on, help me somebody. I've named all the easy ones. Zachariah. There you go. That's a good one. Who? Huh? Daniel. You have to show me on that one. That's all right. You're all right. No problem. Sheep and cows. Sheep and cows. The, okay. Now we're stretching. Simeon. Simeon. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. All right. Good job. Holy timeline. God's got a plan. He's bringing Jesus into the world to save us of our sins. Number two, there are characters involved in the unfolding of this holy timeline. This holy night had real people involved. A real virgin with a baby. What is this? A real husband who's got a wife or an an engaged wife who's pregnant, has never known a man. He's in a spot. Right, everybody's in a spot. All these characters are in a difficult spot. The entourage of supporting characters, angelic messengers, worshipers, and enemies. Let's then go first and the angelic messengers. When God is doing something, he very often in the, in the scriptures announces his doing with angels. Uh, does God still speak to us with angels? Not in my experience. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Is it the same as what we see repeated over and over in a situation, in a story like this? No, we don't see this today. If you said to me, I had an angelic encounter, I would believe you if you're a credible person. I I could believe that. But it's not like it was then. God was doing a once in a world kind of thing. When God's doing a once in a world kind of thing, He might appoint and uh, include whatever characters he chooses, including angels. So look at how the angels, these these messengers, are speaking to the folks and uh, making this whole thing work. Now, what I'm going to need to do, there's so many verses here. I'm going to just need to read them to you. There are too many to put up on the screen. Matthew 1.20. Do the Bible drill now. Turn there. Matthew 1.20. Angelic messengers, and um, in Matthew chapter 1, Joseph has, has realized that, that Mary is expecting. And so, um, verse 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, Resolved to divorce her quietly. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. An angel speaks to Joseph in the depth of his despair. He loves Mary He wants to marry Mary, but Mary is pregnant with someone's baby, and it's not Joseph's, and he knows it. And so he thinks, I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to humiliate her. I will just simply break this off and move on. And the the angel comes to Joseph and says, this baby in Mary's womb is the baby of the Holy Spirit. This baby is not from, uh, from wrong actions. This baby is from God. An angel comes to intercept the ruin that Joseph, in his natural inclination, was about to unopen up on the whole timeline. 
Timeline of what? A Savior coming, prophesied from eternity past, enters the world, fully God, fully man, for the purpose of saving people of their sins. This timeline is moving, moving, moving. And then the persons involved in the timeline, here was one that could have been a huge mess. What if Joseph had divorced Mary? What then? What then? I'm talking about an angel intercepted a man before man's natural inclinations could ruin the timeline being fulfilled by the sovereign God. Angels you will find in the Bible carrying out the plan and work of God. Because of the necessity of this baby coming into the world to be God and man so he could die for our sins. Because of this very great necessity, Joseph could not ruin it. Joseph couldn't ruin it, so the angel says to him, Hey, you don't, don't do that. You, you're good. And it was, by the way, when God is really working on you, it will be so clear to you. Joseph didn't come out of his dream and say, Ooh, I, I, I wonder if the... Uh, if the pizza was off that caused me to dream that. No, Joseph was impacted. Zachariah received a word from the angelic messenger. Zachariah, this is Luke now, Luke 1, 11. Zachariah was to be the father of John the Baptist. In verse 11, chapter 1, Luke. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing in the right side of the altar of incense. And Zachariah was troubled when he saw him, and, he fear, and fear fell on him. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. John the Baptist is a necessary forerunner prophetically for the, for the Lord Jesus. No John the Baptist, no Jesus. The forerunning prophetic word of God requires the Baptist, John, to precede Jesus. Zechariah couldn't mess up the timeline. An angel will intercept the man in his natural inclination to fail to carry out the timeline of Almighty God. And very often, the things that we're puzzled about, scratching our heads, why did you let that happen, God? Because he's carrying out his timeline. And he's not going to let you mess it up. And so you say, well, I don't, I don't like that. I want to be in control. Do you? You want to be in control to what end? Your plans established? I don't want to be in control. I want God to be in control, and I want his place to be established and he and his goodness will not let me mess it up. And so a prayer for me is like this. Okay, God, I don't know what to do in this situation. Don't let me mess it up. Do you know how many bad sermons I have preached in my life? Dina has the number. She's tracked them. It's a large number. It's a very large number. It's getting larger all the time. When I preach something and I think, you know what, I said that wrong. I misquoted that. I said the wrong thing. That's the wrong scripture. I'm thinking, I go home and I'm thinking, you know what I do to cover myself? I say, okay, God, these are your people. This is your church. This is your kingdom. You fix what I'm trying to break in my human frailty. And therefore, very often what I thought, hey, that sermon, you know what, it didn't make sense. It didn't no good. I, uh, people would come to me and say, oh, you know what, I was crying in my car thinking about me and God. and I said, you, you were talking, you listening to me? <laughs> oh, it's the scripture. Yes. You see what I'm saying? What I'm talking about, these angels are coming to intercept the natural inclination of human flesh to prevent the timeline of God being unfolded. And this is what your life experience is. And therefore, you've got no cause or right, or even it would be truly foolish for you to look at God and say, why? And why now? And what are you going to do? Why don't you say instead, you almighty God are carrying out your plans upon this earth. 
And I am a character and a participant in your holy plans. Do not let me mess it up. And even if it takes an angel to come and tell you to stay out of it, that's what God will do to carry out his plans. More angelic. He came to Mary, Luke 1.26. Luke 1.26. And this is so beautiful. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed of a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, the angel came to Mary and said, what? Oh, favored one. The Lord is with you, but she is greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you, are found, you have found favor with God and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus and he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom of his kingdom, there will be no end. The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. This is to be John the Baptist, right? And this is the sixth month with her. Who was, who was previously barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. See that? Now verse 37, see it? Nothing will be impossible with God. We've got an angel speaking to Mary about her anxiety about being a virgin mother. In the angel's dialogue with her, he says, your, your cousin, Elizabeth, too, is pregnant. She's been barren. She's an old, older, older person. And she's, uh, she's been barren. And now she's going to have a baby, too. And then notice, but nothing is impossible with God. In the carrying out of God's great and lofty plan to redeem us to himself, nothing is impossible for him in the pursuit of his own glory and the redemption of his people. Nothing is impossible for God to bring you to himself. You. You say, well, God is dealing directly with me as a person? Oh, yeah. These angelic visits, you say, well, if God sent me an angel, I would believe. Here's your angel. Listen to the word of God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And the angel is the spirit of God speaking to you and says, I believe that. That's true. More angels. Angel speaks to Mary, says, Mary, don't be afraid. The angel speaks to the shepherds, Luke 2, 8 through 12. Let's read it. Our purpose here is to, is to look at this birth narrative, to see it. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. So the angels come to, uh, uh, to the shepherds. This will be a sign to you that you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there, were, uh, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. So the angels have spoken to Joseph and Zechariah and Mary and to the shepherds and to the wise men. Matthew 2, 1 and 2. Read on your own. The, the angels are speaking to the wise men, directing them where to go to see the baby. And the wise men are following a star that is put there. For, for, for their benefit to learn of the baby Jesus. And then in Matthew 2, 13 through 15, uh, the angel speaks again to Joseph. In fact, the angels come to Joseph three times in the narrative. First time, the angels say to Joseph in a dream, hey, your wife, she's good. Go ahead and marry her. There's no problem. It's, she's, she's got the baby, but this is the baby of God. Angels come to Joseph then. Angels come to Joseph then after the baby is born and there's risk of Herod killing the baby. The angels tell Joseph to flee to Egypt. And this was necessary, remember, that the Old Testament prophets would be fulfilled, that Jesus would come out of Egypt. Now we're talking about a timeline. 
the certainty of Almighty God to carry out His holy purposes. And every little detail is perfectly cared for by an Almighty Sovereign God. Everything is being taken care of. He had to come out of Egypt. How are we going to get this person? How are we going to get this baby, this new mother, and Joseph, penniless, broke? How are we going to get him from Bethlehem, where the baby was born? They want to go back to Nazareth, which was his hometown. How are we going to get him to Egypt? Because the prophets said the Messiah would come out of Egypt. God had it all worked out, and it was pain and stress that brought about the open door to get to Egypt. We got to get to Egypt so that we can fulfill the plan of God. And the Egypt is a very difficult journey to take. It's pain. It's disease. It might be divorce. It might be job problems, financial problems. Egypt is a hard place, but it's for a holy purpose. Your Egypt is for a holy purpose. I proclaim by faith that every Egypt in my life is for a holy purpose. I proclaim that by faith. Nothing's going to take away the benefit of the pain I'm going through. Nothing's going to take away the benefit of that, especially not my unbelief. Because my belief is saying the pain I endure in this present world is not worthy to be compared to the great glory that's going to be contributed, given to us by the God who carries out his perfect plan. So you see the timeline. It's got to work. Any little failure, he can't be the Messiah. And the devil knows. We'll kill the baby, thought Herod. He'll never challenge me in my rule. God had other plans. The Messianic language to the wise men and to Joseph again. Get that baby to Egypt. The angelic messengers, the worshipers. What is this entourage around this Christmas day? Messengers and worshipers. Mary's song. I want you to listen to this beautiful song that Mary, uh, I assume she sang it. It's melodic. It's written in verse style in the Greek. Listen to what Mary said. It's called the Magnificat. Mary's song. Luke 1, 46. And Mary said, this is after uh, she understands what, is, what, what Jesus is, is coming to her as a gift. And she said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed And he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. By the way, in Mary's song, for fun, you ought to underline her personal language. For me, they will call me blessed. Underline these personal pronouns. Me, he's done great things for me. Holy is his name. Verse 50, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He has spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her, Elizabeth, the three months and returned to her home. Mary's beautiful, magnificent song. Worshippers. Certainly there were worshippers. There were enemies. There were enemies. This was Herod, Matthew 2, 1 through 15. For time's sake, I'll just rehearse in your memory. Herod was very jealous, and he'd heard from the wise men, that there was a baby born. And they they knew of the star, a magnificent celestial uh, event. And so Herod asked for the wise men to come and tell him what was going to be happening. And so they did. And it became very clear that Herod's intentions were, were to kill the baby boys so that his throne, his kingdom, would be safe. Oh, but intercepting 
the evil, wicked motivations of these world, this world's leaders, like Herod, God intercepted by his authority, by his grace, by his work, by his providence. He intercepted so that what? The baby would be rescued by fleeing to Egypt, therefore fulfilling the, the prophecies. And then finally, these enemies like Herod, uh, he died. You know, eventually your, your enemies will die, you know. You, you, you might not can beat them, but you can outlive them. Maybe. There were enemies also, like remember, those that were unconcerned. I put that in the notes. The person who said there's no room, there's, nowhere, there's no place to go. This was a very uh, a large peop- number of people were going to their hometowns to register for the taxes. And so all the hotels were booked. There was no room for Jesus. If they knew it was Jesus, if they only knew. And that really will be the song of all of uh, secular creation. Eventually, at the judgment, if, if, if they only knew who Jesus was. And uh, I hope you know who Jesus is this, this Christmas. I hope you do. He's the one who came on purpose by God to redeem you of your sins. Don't be a hater. You say, I don't hate Jesus. You might as well hate him. You treat him like you don't even care or know him, some of you. You might as well hate him. You're more honest to say, I have zero interest in God or the things of God. Have zero interest. At least you're being honest. Do not take a haughty posture toward a holy God. Don't take a haughty posture toward a holy God. You can take an honest posture toward a holy God and say, I don't understand you, I'm hurting. I'm sad. I don't know what to do next. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm broke. I'm broken. I'm lonely. You can say all of those things and do it with good conscience and right relationship with the Father. Don't be haughty with God. He's holy. And if you don't understand something, you can ask. But do it humbly. Matthew 1, 21 and 23, and I'll close with this. Matthew 1, 21 and 23. This great gospel promise of Christmas. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken of by the prophet. That was the timeline. God had it planned. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And men and enemies and problems and circumstances and rulers, none of it will stop them. Behold, this virgin shall conceive. She will bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The coming of Jesus into the world truly ought to thrill us because to think of it, nothing can stop God from carrying out his plan. Even a plan that required a divine, a divine inclusion into this human realm. Nothing could stop it. That's how God feels about you, by the way. You think, well, if God... You're living... You're living numb. You're, 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 you're spiritually numb. You're numb. So, well, how do I not be numb? Call out to God and say, God, I, don't, I have zero interest in you. Zero. Be honest with God like that and see what happens. Be honest with God. I don't have any interest. In fact, I kind of want to hide from you. Like Adam and Eve were wanting to hide from God. That's how most of us are. That's how many of us are today. That's how all of us are before we come to be born again believers. How do we become born again believers? So we desire new things. Jesus called out very simply, repent and believe the gospel. Repent, turn around. Turn around from your unbelief. Turn around from your determination to be the ruler and, and, and king of your own life. Turn around from that. And rely on Jesus, who God sent through all of this, 
this very intricate timeline of details, making sure that there was no failure at any point to get you to this point where you are right here today. To get you to this point where you are right here today so that you could say, I do believe in you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for becoming a man so that you understood, you could understand my pain and suffering as a man, a person. Repent. Turn around. Don't be so stubborn. Most of your problem in keeping you away from God is you're so stubborn. You just decided it's going to be your way or no way. And if God won't play your way, then you won't play with God. And that'll be the last thought you ever think before the judgment. At the judgment, you'll change your mind, but it will be too late. Repent and believe the gospel. What is this gospel? God loves you. He gave himself, his own son for you. This is the gospel. Repent. Stop being so stubborn and determined. Give your life over to God as best you know how and watch what he does over, over your lifetimes. Just, just, I, I, just do it. That's the way you do it. That's what you do. I pray you will. So this Christmas, give yourself to Jesus and see what happens. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of Christ. You brought him into the world and nothing of this world Rulers, circumstances, difficulties, none of those things could prevent your, your, your carrying out your plan to save your people. Help us to recognize this and to respond rightly by faith so that we may be born again and be adopted children. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.